Chapter 2 of A Narrative of the Life of Rev. Noah Davis, a Colored Man. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Brian Ness. A Narrative of the Life of Rev. Noah Davis, a Colored Man, by Himself. Chapter 2 Apprentice to the Shoemaking learns housework, intemperance, a negro can't be trusted, learning how to write and cipher. In December 1818, for the first time in my life, I left my parents to go a distance from home, and I was sad at the thought of parting with those whom I loved and reverenced more than any persons on earth. But the expectation of seeing Fredericksburg, a place which from all I had then learned, I supposed must be the greatest place in the world, reconciled me somewhat with the necessity of saying good-bye to the dear ones at home. I arrived at Fredericksburg after a day and a half's travel in a wagon, a distance of some fifty miles. Having arrived in town, a boy green from the country, I was astonished and delighted at what appeared to me the splendor and beauty of the place. I spent a merry Christmas at my old master's stately mansion, along with my older brother, and for a while forgot the home on the farm. But soon another home was selected for me, where I might learn a trade, and as I preferred the boot and shoemaking, I was put to Mr. Thomas Wright, a man of sterling integrity, who was considered the best workman in the whole town. Here I had an older brother living, which was some inducement for my going to live with Mr. Wright. I was bound to serve until I should be twenty-one years old. This was in January 1819. Upon entering with Mr. Wright, I learned that the colored boys had to serve one year with Mrs. Wright in the house and kitchen. The object of this was to train them for future usefulness, when called from the shop, to serve as waiters or cooks. Mrs. Wright was a good manager and a very particular housekeeper. I used to think she was too particular, but I have learned better since. I have often wished, when I have been seeking homes for my children, that I could find one like Mrs. Wright. She would spare no pains to teach her servants how she wanted her work done, and then she would spare no pains to make them do it. I have often looked back with feelings of gratitude and veneration to that pious lady for her untiring perseverance in training me up in the way I should go. But she is gone, as I trust, to receive the reward of righteousness in a better world. After I had been under Mrs. Wright's special charge the first year, she could leave me to cook a dinner, or clean the house, or do anything she might set me at, without her being present. I was now considered fit to take my seat among the hands in the shop. Here I found quite a new state of things. The shoemakers at that time, in Fredericksburg, were considered the most intemperate of any class of men in the place, and as the apprentice boys had always to be very obliging to the journeymen, in order to get along pleasantly with them, it was my duty to be runner for the shop, and I was soon trained how to bring liquor among the men with such secrecy as to prevent the boss, who had forbidden it to come on the premises, from knowing it. But in those days the drinking of ardent spirits was a common practice even among Christians. With such examples all around, I soon learned the habit of drinking, along with every other vile habit to which my companions were addicted. It was true, in my case, that evil communications corrupt good manners, and had it not been for the strictness with which my boss and his amiable lady watched over me, I should in all probability have become a confirmed drunkard before my time was out. But they held the reins over me, and kept me in until I had served out my apprenticeship. I can say, however, that much as I was inclined to other vices and sins, Mr. Wright readily gave me a recommendation for honesty, truthfulness, and goodness of character. In fact, he had felt such confidence in me that he would often leave his shoe store in my care when he would have to go to the north for a supply of stock. And I can truly say that I never deceived him when he thus trusted me. Nothing would mortify me as much as to hear it said a negro can't be trusted. This saying would always nerve me with a determination to be trustworthy. If I was trusted, I would deserve to be trusted. I wanted to show that principle was not confined to color. But I have been led to look at it since, and have thought that perhaps it was more pride than principle in me at that time, for I was a wicked sinner. 
The first idea I ever got of writing was from trying to imitate my employer, who used to write the names of his customers on the lining of the boots and shoes, as he gave them out to be made. So I tried to make letters, and soon succeeded in writing my name, and then the word Fredericksburg, and so on. My father had previously taught me the alphabet in the spelling book before I had left the mill. After I became religious, I would carry my father's New Testament to church, and always try to get to meeting in time to hear the preacher read a chapter before a sermon. If he named the chapter before reading it, I would soon find it. In this way I gathered much information in pronouncing many hard words in the scriptures. It was a long time before I learned the meaning of the numeral letters put in the Bible over the chapters. I had often seen them in the spelling book running alongside a column of figures, but no one ever told me that they were put there for the same use as the figures. End of chapter 2 Recorded by Brian Ness